here's an experience that I believe I've had and, and I believe many other people have had. I mean, it's certainly well attested to in, in the literature on these things. And it's an experience that the Advaita people tend to not acknowledge. Now, this is not true of all of them, but some of them. So, you know, I, did, did you ever meet Punjaji in India? Yeah, I spent a year there. Yeah. Oh, you, you did? Oh, interesting. Uh, so, what year? Um, 91, around Christmas. So, it was either 90, 91, or 91, 92. So, this is before he had been discovered by the, the Rajneeshis, and it was a, had a much smaller scene there? I mean, there, there could, mm. w- would have only been a few people in that early, right? No. No, this was after that. This was after Osho had died. There were quite a few people there. Oh, it was so, getting bigger. Oh, but that, so that had to be later than 91, I think. No, uh, no. I'm pretty, well, it might have been. I'm pretty certain it was 91. But oh, anyway. interesting. Okay, so yeah, I was there before all of that, although I thought it was, if I had to have guessed, I would have, thought, would have put it around 91. But um, you know, so before he was discovered by Osho's people. Yeah. So yeah, so anyway, so Punjaji, as you know, was um, also fairly uncompromising in the way he would talk about this. I mean, he wouldn't, you know, unlike someone like his teacher, Ramana Maharshi, he, he wouldn't say, he wouldn't make any concessions to practice or to gradualism or to effort. And the explicit message was Either you understand what I'm talking about, or it's hopeless, right? There's nothing for you. There's nothing you are going to go do on your own mm. to make any progress, right? So just you know, understand what I'm saying right now, or there's no path. And if you do understand what I'm saying, there's still no path, right? There's nothing for you to do yeah. with this understanding, right? There's no. You're not going to mm. practice the implications of this conversation right now if you understand you're done. And if you think you need to practice anything on the basis of what I just said, you didn't understand what I just said, right? So it's like the steepest mm. possible path. So there, there are two reasons why I think he was wrong about that. And mm. the first is that it was obvious what the consequences of, of that style of teaching were among many people. People would you know, seem to see the light in the midst of, you know, having that conversation with him, somebody would jump up and say, I get it. You know, I, you know, I, I, yeah. I see it. And it was pretty clear from spending some time with those people afterwards that, you know, in the aftermath of their full enlightenment, they were not going to be the next Buddha of the age, right? I mean, these people yeah. were still neurotic and confused in various ways. And they would, and now they had been delivered a message that spiritual practice was completely pointless, and they, they accepted that, but then they went back to their lives and began you know, seeking happiness in all the usual ways, and they just no, no longer had a spiritual option. Yeah. You know, the path had been taken away from them, and then they're left with 12-step programs and going to Burning Man and what, 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 anything else they were doing. Yeah. You know? yeah. And so there was that problem. But there was also the problem that many of us had this this more intermediate experience, which is we recognized the non-duality that was being described, but the recognition was unstable. You, you recognize it, but then you could overlook it again. So essentially, mm. your, your mindfulness became non-dual, but you weren't made perfectly mindful for the rest of your life by virtue of having had this insight. Yeah, There still seemed to be something to practice in the sense that there still was this oscillation between being distracted by thought and clearly recognizing what is prior to thought. Mm. It's not nullified by the arising of thought, but it is, there's still an apparent difference between recognizing and not recognizing. And Punjaji didn't, didn't seem to be conceding that. You know, he's basically said, if you recognize for one second, you'll be stable for the rest of your life. And that just seemed to be disconfirmed by the experience of Many many people, hmm. so I, I you know I put that to you as as a what I perceive to be the liability of this way of talking about it. Yeah, yeah, it is it is um it is it is very radical. I'll have to say with the way you describe it, it sounds like what I was talking about is an experience that I had or non-experience of the I am prior to thought, 
which seems to be sort of what Punjaji was talking about, which is why he would say, don't take a thought. Or he did suggest when I was there, he was suggesting, who am I as a, um, I can't remember if he actually said it or if it was just in the crowd mm-hmm. who said it. But there seemed to be some suggestion that there was a state that one could be in. And um, I, I'm really talking about something radically different. You don't think Punjaji was also talking about emptiness and non-duality in the sense that you're referencing those It sense? doesn't seem so. It doesn't seem so because he's still, he was still talking to someone, suggesting that they do certain things, such as don't take a... Th- I can't remember anything he said, quite honestly, <laughs> but I do remember feeling like there was something that needed to be done. I did not get the, um, the radical nature that there wasn't anywhere else. And that experience of something else has to do with an illusory experience of a solidity as a center to the appearance. Mm. I, and I just, I find that, that his tradition and um, the people that came after him and, and the one before him were really talking about something different. Now, if they meant the same thing, I don't know. But yeah, that, the yeah. way they talk okay. about it, they make concessions to individuals. And this, this, this makes no concessions. So yeah, maybe I, I got him in a very Jim Newman mood because to my ear, he was saying the same thing. <laughs> okay. But I could see that he could be pushed in the direction of making concessions to something that seemed like a practice or... Yeah. I, I'm, not, I'm not that well-versed on him. I mean, even though I was there for you, I sat in front of him a couple of times, asked a few questions, and there were always some sort of suggestions of something, something needed to happen. It could have been what the Osho people did to him when they got there with all of their maybe their tantric yeah. energy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um perhaps you can help me with my apparent dilemma here. So my perception of myself is that I can experience again to use a loaded term for which I don't have it's a It's not a, loaded in that sense. It's that it points to separation. For experience, there well, is no, a, a, there's a subject and an object. No. And so what I'm, what I'm about to say is that you know, experience non-duality, experience emptiness, experience no separation, whatever, however you want to. I'm not sure which verb yeah, you like. I, wouldn't, I would never, but I just don't see it as an experience. It's just simply not an experience. I know you don't like that. What, what's, it's not is, a mind feel you're walking into. It's, it's that what's being suggested is just radically different than what's normally expected. There's nothing that you're saying that, that is unexpected. It's just I, I'm not quite sure w- which words capture it. So what word would you use for the understanding, the recognition of this thing we're talking about? Yeah, so I don't, it doesn't seem, as you, you well, you pointed to it when you said your hand, you don't actually right. know what it is. Yeah. And the suggestion is that that is all there is. And, and not as a practice or as an experience. Well, it's, it's the ground of any experience. It equalizes all experience. Well, it's not not an experience. By that measure, it's also, it's not somewhere else, right? No. No, well, what we're, what we're, what we're reducing is somewhere else to just what is. There isn't anywhere else. So there is only unknowing appearing as a hand. Mm. The difficulty we're having, I think, is that I'm literally talking about the end of experience because the end of the experiencer. And the, one of the most difficult things about, I think about this message is it sounds like I'm coming or this message is coming from somewhere else and that's not happening there. And really the suggestion is that's all that's happening. And then there's an additional experiencer that's put on top of it that has the illusory experience of knowing. That it, that it could get closer to now or what is mm-hmm. or further away. And the message is truly, you, there is no possibility to get further away from what is or closer to what is. That movement, that apparent differentiation, that apparent experience is illusory. There's only immediacy, unknowable immediacy ar- arising as everything we're discussing. And that never actually moves. There never mm. is anything else. And that, that has no, 
no beginning or end to it. There's no boundaries to it. So there's, it would be impossible to come up with a word or a definition. When I, I, earlier I said, when the, that contracted energy of me or the positional experience I am falls away, what's revealed, but only as a reflection, as at the appearance is unconditional love. But you can't possibly contain the entire appearance and all that arises with the term unconditional love. That's just a reflection. So really, what we're trying to put into words can't possibly be put into words. What we're trying to drill down on can't even, you couldn't create any distance to it, to be able to objectify it, to get closer or further away from it. It's simply already everything. But there are analogies I think we can draw that are useful that capture the already true aspect of it and the coincidence of it with everything that's apparent. People are having an experience uh, or an apparent experience of being selves in the world. And, mm. you know, so we, we use terms like consciousness and mind and knowing and experience. And it's pretty clear that there are analogs in you just by virtue of the fact that you're having this conversation. You're obviously someone who understands English. Your ears are intact. You can hear me. And you, you can refer to things in your environment. So there's a kind of consensual, you know, intersubjective reality that can be referenced. Yeah. You have the ordinary human operating system that yeah. everyone listening is familiar with. So what we're trying to get across is... That I don't have it. But not, not precisely that, because again, if needed, you know, someone could say, well, what do you want for lunch? And you'd be able to make that decision, right? So it's not like the public functions have disappeared. And, and so we know there must be some ordinary residual that answers to the, you know, many of the concepts we're using here, you know, sights, sounds, yeah. sensations, thoughts. Yeah. I mean, otherwise, this freedom we're talking about would be synonymous with some kind of brain damage, right? We're not Exactly. We're not yeah. celebrating brain damage. We're, we're trying to no. get it, the nature of reality. <laughs> if only it were that easy. You know, a hammer would be the... You could, <laughs> That's right. you could just hand a out lobotomy. hammers. lobotomy. Yeah. Yeah. So how would you describe the phenomenon of someone listening to you teach and getting the point? Like, surely yeah. that's happened, you know, and you, you, you meet those people. Yeah. What is that like? And what is, is there anything to, to be usefully said about the cusp of that moment for people? But because it's, it's an unhappening and because nobody wants it, it, I wouldn't even call it a teaching. A teaching for me has to do with knowing. And you're not, and it, it I, just to, draw clear boundaries. I don't think it's just being pedantic, but it is pointing to something. And I guess the most common response when there's some sort of recognition of what we're talking about is surprise. That it just is completely unexpected. Mm. And that, that seems to be true universally. That it just has nothing to do with the the expected need or wants of the individual and what it thinks this is about. It's constantly, it's a surprise and it's disconcerting. Often, often when that solidity falls away, it isn't what anybody would have wanted. And when the solidity comes back, there's often, well, when it falls away, there's often, because it's not, maybe not complete, there's a panic or a fear that arises. And then it comes back, and there's then the, ex the wish for it to, to happen again. So it just doesn't, it doesn't seem to, to happen in the purview of what one would call a normal experience, a normal process. Well, that's interesting. So in your experience, people can have this, this insight into non-solidity, and then the solidity or apparent solidity can come back. And there seems to be more seeking or more orienting toward it there. And then, so say more about that. I mean, how is well, it? Was it was the same with me. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. So, so it was the same with you. So you, you, you had this, this experience and then you, 
then you were left seeking, trying to get back to it for a time. But then when you got back to it, were there more iterations of that? Or once, once you got back the second time, then it, uh, there was no, no more fluctuation in it? So for me, it, it, if you wanted to describe it as a process, and just so that you understand the paradox of describing this, which is all there is already, mm. as a process of becoming this, which is all, everything already, which is the dream of the individual, it was a, a, it just the fog of ownership, the fog of knowing, as I talked about before, the cloud of knowing just clears up. It just clears up. There can be certain climacterics, like I expressed earlier about the falling away of the contracted energy and how that builds up. But really, that's all completely irrelevant. There is, in the end, this happening isn't relevant. This appearance isn't relevant. And what you point out is that there's a functioning that still happens, but that's never been any different, really. There's just no longer the ownership that arises for the functioning of knowing where the house is or where mm. uh, the, all the things you described before as though this body is called Jim and its history and the ability to talk about what I just talked about. That all arises. It just doesn't arise for a center. And just to be clear, there, is, there are no centers mm. already. Yeah. So this isn't about, we're not, the, the message has no intention on changing the appearance because there's no, there's obviously nothing that needs to happen. That, that need only arises in the experience of the individual. Right, but there is this, I guess what I'm fishing for here is this seems to be distinct from either the actual teaching or the, the misunderstanding of what Punjaji was teaching, which is that there, uh, the expectation there was that if you recognize this thing, you know, non-solidity, non-duality, no center, that first recognition would be permanent or else you, you haven't really recognized it, right? So it's all, Absolutely. all or nothing. Absolutely. That's true. But that's true. I don't know if he and I were talking about, are talking or we're talking about the same thing. But as I described the falling away of that, the I am and here is the first thing that known, that isn't the end of the individual. The end of the individual is the end of that knowing experience, the knowing cloud that seems to be the center of the appearance. And that isn't an, a happening. And it's impossible to pinpoint actually when that actually happens because it isn't something added on. It's just a clearing up of an illusory sort of fog in which everything seems to arise, as long as there's someone there. But you were just describing people who have this experience where it drops away, but then they get you know, anxious, or it's not, it's not complete, I think you said. And then, That's right. That's right. And then it comes back. But it, see, they're just, there's a different kind of map. I guess I'm, I'm just trying to reconcile two maps of the landscape that perhaps can't be reconciled, but I think one... One subsumes the other in a way. I mean, so like you know, in I don't know how familiar you are with Zogchen or, or any of the these other non-dual teachings. Vaguely, but they would certainly acknowledge that for some people, you know, the first glimpse is the last glimpse, right? And you're just mm. you're basically done in a second. You know, on on a Thursday afternoon, the the apparent person vanishes. But for other people. The glimpse can be had, but it's possible to still get, you know, distracted by thought thereafter. And then the glimpse is no, is no, no less of a glimpse of this you know, underlying ground of, to use a term that the Buddhists love, uh, of emptiness. But you then have to become more familiar with it. There's some apparent work to do to stabilize this intuition, because you're, in fact, you will just be, you know, you're not the lucky person who, who had a single glimpse that was final. You're somebody who is capable of being lost in thought again. You're being distracted by the apparent contents of consciousness. Whereas somebody like Punjaji, you know, and, and many people in the non-dual tradition outside of a tradition like Dzogchen, are unhappy with that picture. You know, that they just think that that's not, in fact, phenomenologically true. 
to glimpse it once is to be done. And I, I mean, I think there are reasons to doubt that picture. I'm just w- I'm wondering which claim you're actually making. Both. I think I quite understand where the misunderstanding is because I described the falling away of the contracted energy, but that isn't the end of the experiential center. Or describing this as unconditional love is not the end of the experiential center. Those are all aspects that are revealed as, as the contracted energy falls away, the end of knowing. Mm. And it, I, I can imagine that if one was saying that that was all there was to see, and I think there might actually be people that say that, then there's just still someone there who thinks they know what happened. Mm. And the, if, here what's being described is that all of those apparent recognitions are still a part of a process and still a part of a story and still a part of the experience that what is in real. And, and the end of it, once seen, which it isn't, and there is no end, is the end of that story, the end of this appearance, and I think we're getting hooked up on this a little bit, the end of this appearance as actually having a context, because it doesn't. And when, that, when this, this appearance is no longer contextual, then whatever arises is just a part of that non-contextual appearance. Mm. So when there's no longer a context, there is no longer an ability for a context to arise because everything arising is simply non-contextual. So that even if you could imagine, which I don't know, that the me or whatever, the contracted energy would arise again, that would still be just non-contextual happening, chaos happening, appearing as whatever this is appearing as. And I don't seem to be able to get it across, but that is already the case. Everything else that seems to happen within that is just part of the dream of the individual, which is constantly within a process. This isn't a process. This is already non-contextual. Yeah, yeah. Well, so here, here are a few things I, I believe. I believe I understand you. I believe mm-hmm. we're, we're speaking about the same thing. And mm-hmm. again, the, the terminology here could trip us up, but I believe that this thing you're pointing to is something fundamental about the nature of all experience, you know, consciousness and its contents in every moment that's not constructed, that doesn't get improved, that doesn't get produced by one's effort. It is the, you know, the non-context of everything that is appearing. I believe I recognize that and can recognize that whenever I pay attention. Again, that, that me use, using a term that has dualistic overtones that are not intended here, but mm. you know, to recognize the centerlessness of the moment. That is obvious to me and is obvious whenever I remember to notice it, right? But I do mm. find that I'm capable of overlooking it. Yeah. But the I, the apparent individual, I'm, I'm capable of being asleep and dreaming again in some sense, you know, if only for moments at a time. And, and that dream is being continually punctuated by this recognition of no inside and no outside or no center. On one account, I either don't get it. On another account, I get it imperfectly and I'm still working out this non-path by this non-dual logic. Within a Dzogchen context, my experience is perfectly understandable. Yeah, I'm, I'm, ha- I'm having the expected experience in a Dzogchen context. In your context, I think I can be heard to not get what you're talking about. Yeah. But the truth is, I don't see any basis for that claim in my experience. No, you wouldn't. Okay, so then help, help perform surgery on my ignorance I can't. Ignorance All here. I can say is you, you say you recognize the non-center, the non-inside and outside, I've never recognized that. I've never recognized what's being shared here. It's not, it has no solidity, fixedness, knowing in it. Okay, but I, so I agree. I think we're just using the term recognition differently, or it's got some okay. onus on it in, in your brain that it doesn't have in mind. But I think if we want to describe what emptiness is like, 
I expect we're going to agree. You know, you know, write down. We'll we'll check all the boxes. I couldn't, but I couldn't describe emptiness. Well, just you, like I couldn't describe well, what you, is. But but you but you just started by saying it's you know the, the non solidity, the non. Hmm. Just you described it in terms of what is not, which is obviously quite a traditional way of doing it. The fact that it's not produced, it's not compounded, it's not many things, it's not one thing, right? It's not unity, but it's not. Well, I think the reason unity. it's 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 spoken about in negative terms, is because it can't be conceived. It can't be, that's, that's where the, the landmines are, is it seems like there's a response when it, it seems like the, this, this which can't be spoken of is put into a context of understanding or knowing or consciousness or recognition. That, that seem, that is, that here, that seems obviously part of the experience of knowing. All right, so so I mean, we're, we're we're getting wrapped around the axle here a little bit, but I, I think it's useful because I you know I, I here here's what I'm imagining. I'm imagining that that our our listeners are more confused than they need to be by our apparent mm. non-alignment here, or or not actually being able to totally converge on on how to talk about this. I, I'm going to tell you two stories here that get at. Parts of the problem that I'm trying to get across, and and I just to, it'd be interesting to get your reaction to them. So the the problem I've had with this style of kind of radical non-duality and and a, an apparent unwillingness to make certain traditional distinctions, so certain pathy sounding distinctions, is the following. And this actually this this came out of my experience with Punjaji. So as I said, so there are many people who are studying with Punjaji who would have some epiphany with him, that have some breakthrough, and he would celebrate them as essentially the the Buddha of the day, right? Yeah. So like if somebody, mm. I, I was there once with a few uh, you know Buddhist teachers who you know we had brought to to see Punjaji. We were spending ten days with Punjaji, and then we we were going to get uh, Zogchen teachings from Tuku Organ in Nepal, uh, who we hadn't yet met, and um, so it's kind of a spiritual tour. And so we went to Punjaji first, and somewhere near the end of our stay there, this woman uh, had some kind of breakthrough, and you know, she was really a, a wonderful person, you know, very, just a very happy person, a good advertisement for the, the benefits of full enlightenment. And mm-hmm. you know, Punjaji was celebrating her as essentially you know, done. You know, she had finished the whole program, right? She had the, this breakthrough and she was talking the talk of, you know, there's nothing but consciousness or there's nothing but emptiness. or And, you know, so on Punchji's account, there was no more to do. There were no more, there's no more distinctions to make. Any talk about meditation or effort or paths at this point would have been blasphemy, essentially. Mm-hmm. And then we were leaving to go to see Tukur again. And this woman asked if she could come with us. She just wanted to kind of Probably test her enlightenment against you know some other system, and so she, you know as she was a you know a, a very nice woman, we thought yeah great you know she's good company. So we went to Nepal, and so we were in the room with her and a few other people getting Tuk Organ's non-dual teachings, and um, once uh, that process started, at some point you know he asked for questions, and she launched into her Punjaji approved account. Of her own enlightenment, mm. and this was a fascinating moment because uh, I mean, I had to get through translation, which was which was amusing. But you know, once it became clear what she was claiming about herself, she was claiming there was no individual. She was claiming, you know, many of the much of the language you, know, you have used and I have used in this conversation, she was expressing. And at one point, Tulgorgian said, "Well." How often are, are thoughts arising for you? I mean, how often are you thinking, and what's that like? And she said, "Oh, no, I haven't had a thought in a week." Hmm. And he said, "Well, wait a minute." You, you, and it was comical to see how this it was struggling to get through translation. But at a certain point, he said, "Okay, we're all just going to wait for you to have your next thought. I can't proceed with what I was planning for today's seminar until we drill down on this. So we're all patient people. We're just going to wait." For you to have a thought, hmm. and over the course of thirty seconds, we we watched her enlightenment completely unravel. What became clear 
is that she was, you know, she was a very happy, kind of ecstatic person who was, you know, had a lot of concentration or some concentration, and she was having these, she was having a great experience, right? She was very blissful. Mm. And she was probably just thinking incessantly about how empty everything was and how beautiful and how <laughs> non dual. And like she was just not mindful enough to know that she was lost in very happy thoughts basically every mm. moment of the day, right? So that's what I see as a, a liability here that there's a, if you're not going to avail yourself of any pathy language, you know, w- that will allow you to differentiate the difference between being lost in thought or not. You can't necessarily catch the people who come away thinking that they're Buddhas or that there's nothing left to do or that any mm. use of attention is is just as much a symptom of ignorance as any other use of attention. Mm. Whereas I, you know, what I, I, I don't know what went on to happen to her, but my perception of that moment was that, you know, Took Oregon had performed a kind of a necessary spiritual intervention, essentially, and got her mm. back, made her available again to recognizing what her experience actually was and you know she could look more deeply into things you know whether you call that practice or not anyway that was the first story that was in my brain to bounce off of you i just i i worry yeah. that there's if the path is infinitely steep people bounce off of it in ways that are you know unfortunate yeah yeah i i don't think i think it's it's um it's an un, the what What's being shared here is truly unwantable in that sense. Whereas, as you said, as you described with Punjaji, that was something that had some kudos to it of no thinking or bliss. That's just not, there's this, and I guess, I guess the, this, what's being shared isn't a teaching. I try, I think a lot of our misunderstanding isn't pedantic. It's, it's different. Um, well, it's a perspective running into no perspective, because this isn't a teaching, and it isn't actually concerned in that sense of the um, people that come. It's it's not expected for anybody to to get anything. It's not it's not intentional. The message it merely points out, and I think what's already in a way known and undeniable, and that is what seems to be happening, this, is everything. And that can be misunderstood. I mean, people walk away and go, well, Jim says there's nothing to do. And that's just simply not what's being suggested. There's, the suggestion is there isn't anyone that ever does anything, and that sense of need to find something missing is illusory. I believe, I totally believe people misunderstand it, I am certain that that's a lot of what happens at the meetings is that it's misunderstood. It's very difficult because it doesn't, it doesn't, it, you can't reference it at any point because it's not within anyone's experience. And you, you can't relate to it because it doesn't meet the needs of the individual for something to happen. One of the core experiences of the individual is that something needs to happen. That's still part of the illusion. And that will take what's being suggested and try to put it into practice. I call it, I call it applied non-duality. It just doesn't make any sense. Non-duality isn't, isn't something separate as a concept to be attained or found. It's, it's pointed out as non From this perspective, it's pointed out as non-duality because there isn't any separation already. Any effort to attain is merely the obscu- obs- obscuring the fact that it isn't separate. There isn't a separation to overcome. Yeah, well, that, that's interesting. I think that's a useful concept that may differentiate or, the, the, or may clarify the ways in which we're talking past each other here or at cross purposes. So applied non-duality. <laughs> in my view, there certainly seems to be a stage of this process where applied non-duality isn't as crazy or as as counterproductive as y- you seem to suggest right mm-hmm. i mean th- i mean there there's something to recognize again for many people and it's not that the first recognition wasn't of the real non-duality it's just mm-hmm. that it wasn't final 
you know, within the dream, the, the, the experience of waking up from this dream can have apparent stages for people, even though once you have finally woken up, it may not make any sense to talk about stages, or the stages were illusory, right? So, But they don't have anything to do with anyone. Yes. The, the experience or the idea that there's a process or that they have something to do or that there's a, a benefit is still a part of the illusory experience that this has some intention to it, the appearance. And that implies the, that there's a better way for this to be and a worse way for this to be. But then what do you mean when you use a term like unconditional love? Right. I mean, that's some ancillary benefit of this or, or some aspect of this that is, you know, I'm not surprised at all by that term, but I would have been surprised if you had said unconditional anger or unconditional shame. Right? Same like, thing. As far as I'm concerned, that's a, those are all really the same thing. Unconditional love is merely a response to the conditional experience of the individual, that love is conditional. And when that falls away, it's obvious that there isn't any condition to love. Mm. But it, I think it would be a fallacy to say that, the appear, that, that what we're talking about is unconditional love, because really what we're talking about is what can't be spoken about. There is actually no way to find an edge or an other in order to objectify or define the whole of the appearance. It's, and here comes another one that's not true, but it's just another reflection of that falling away of the conditional freedom of the individual. It's too unconditionally free to be defined or contained. And, I, and, and what's recognized is that the whole process is that unconditional freedom having the experience that something needs to happen. It is that unconditional love having the experience that it's conditional. So there is no, there is, there is just simply no separation to overcome. That only, that only arises in the illusory experience of the individual. And the and, and illusory, but truly illusory experience of the individual. There's no individual. Yeah, no. So uh, the second story I was going to bounce off of you, which is one I just stumbled upon. I think it's about ten years old, but I, I stumbled upon it relatively recently. There was a um, tourist bus somewhere in in Scandinavia, I think, uh, Norway, Sweden, somewhere, and and they they pulled into a rest stop, and there were about thirty people on the bus, and the uh, the tourists got off to use the bathroom and and get something to eat, and one of the tourist was, a, uh, I believe, an Asian woman who got off and she changed her clothes before getting back on the bus. And when everyone was back on the bus, some people noticed that there was an, an Asian woman who hadn't yet gotten back on the bus, who, was, who, who they were concerned not to leave behind. And so they, they went looking for her and couldn't find her. And then a search party was, was formed and they, you know, they called the police and they, they readied a helicopter that was going to take off at dawn to look for this missing tourist. And at some point during these machinations, I mean, many hours into it, the woman realized that she was the missing tourist, <laughs> right? Yeah. And so, yeah. And so it's, the, this struck me as a beautiful analogy for the process we're talking about. It, it's not true to say, but when you, when you focus on what that moment of epiphany was like, when the tourist who was never lost, you know, discovers that she has, you know, is part of the search party that is part of the problem looking for her. It's not true to say that the search was ever consummated. Mm. The lost tourist was never found because the tourist was never lost, right? And there's something in that in that unraveling that is instructive here that you're not when you recognize the way again to use my terms here, you know, mm. the way consciousness already is. The fact that it already doesn't have a self in the middle of it, and it doesn't get improved by what it knows. There's nothing you need to do to it to make it empty or expansive or non-dual. Mm. Then that recognition has this quality of the very premise by which you sought to recognize it, you know, that effort 
it's not fulfilled. It's just the basis from which you made it has been undercut. But again, I, I do, it's my experience, and I'm, I'm certainly not alone in this, that there's this stage or apparent stage in this process where you're still having to notice this. Again, I, I don't know which verb is, is sanctioned here, but you're still having to become more familiar with this. Otherwise, there's this apparent experience of being able to overlook it, you know, for the purpose of getting angry or, or getting distracted by things in the world or, you know, getting awareness trimmed down by something that happens to which you're reacting, to which, you, it, you, once again, you are the, the ape who is reacting to the world. And then the process is one of cutting through that again and noticing this intrinsic mystery to experience, to consciousness. Yeah. And w yet what I'm hearing from you is your concern that that really isn't the recognition. I realize recognition is not your favorite term, but that isn't the insight, that there's something more, more or less to be discovered here that is, that emphatically ends this pseudo search. There are no stages yeah. to it. Yeah, absolutely. That, that there isn't actually a mystery that needs to be solved. The experience that there needs to be an answer just comes out of the illusory experience of separation, that this mystery is never actually solved. The, the lost individual, that uh, the lost tourist is never found. But I, certainly I agree with that, right? It captures to me how things seem when I'm paying attention. Right? Let's drill down. Can, we, can, can, we, can I ask a couple of things and just yeah. drill down on a couple of points, That'd be great. Such, as, such as consciousness? Because it's just obvious here that the, that is part of the illusory experience of the individual. Consciousness is an experience in separation. And in that experience, one can be more or less conscious. And that changes the perspective or the experience of the individual. Yeah, so I, I'm not using consciousness in that sense. I mean, I would use it as synonymous with this apparent happening, right? The fact that, the fact that anything is appearing, being... the fact that anything seems to be any way at all is the fact of consciousness. Yeah, but you're talking about being able to be more or less conscious and that having to do with being more or less aware. No, or more well, or less. You use certain words. I can't remember your words exactly. Well, no, the, well, uh, conventionally speaking, you can be, there are degrees of consciousness, you know, with respect to, you know, wakefulness, general anesthesia. You know, I, I, yeah. Yeah, I, I remain yeah. agnostic as to what it's actually like to be in some of those states that we can't remember, whether it's a failure of memory or, a, or an actual interruption of consciousness, that's yeah. very difficult to distinguish. And, and, but in terms of degrees of awareness of this thing we're talking about, I, mean, I, I would agree with you, it's paradoxical. It makes no sense to overlook it. It's not possible. Well, it's, it's apparently possible because there's this... Only in the illusory... Ex it's, but the overlooking is an illusion. It never actually happens. Yes. So the idea that you could unhappen, make it unhappen, it's just part of the illusion, part of the experience that it is happening. It never happens. It's not happening now. That's true. <laughs> That's true. But the, to use your language you used before, this, this wisp of a cloud that can just go away, right? Like the sense mm. of self, the sense of there being an individual in the middle of experience, that can evaporate, mm. right? Yeah. And but my and the evaporation, the evaporation is recognized as never having happened. So it's not something that's added on. It's not I now have a new experience. It's it's actually the evaporation of experience. And what's left is the recognition that there never was experience, but that's not a recognition of what this is. Okay, so, but then what would you say to someone who believes that this evaporation experience can happen many times, a thousand times, 10,000 times? I don't agree with that. I think there can be many different, rec many different sort of revelations, uncoverings of 
what's being hidden by the illusory experience of the individual. But the end of the cloud of ownership is the end of experience, the end, as we said, context. And then there's thereafter, of which there isn't, there isn't a context which anything could arise and create a context. There is just simply, but it's already the case. I mean, it's so obvious that what's happening isn't connected to anything else. It's whole in and of itself. Mm. It has no need to have a history. It has no need to have a future. It is in and of itself whole and in that way singular, unconnected to anything else. And so you can't even really wrap your arms around it con uh, conceptually because it's just simply without limit. And anything that arises is that. Just because there's a thought of the past is not evidence of a past. It mm. merely is this non-contextual appearance appearing as a past. So there's no, there, there would be no way for, there, for anything to happen to create a need of context. Now, the brain still functions. This can still find home in the grocery store and all of that. But that doesn't happen within a context for anyone. It's just simply what is arising as whatever function seems to be happening. And there's nobody conscious of that. And you couldn't get closer or further away from it. That, that, that whole experience is just part of the illusory dream. And everything that happens in it as far as a process is merely a process, an illusory process, inside this hmm. which is already non-contextual.